Namaste and good evening everyone. Today is 23rd of July and we are continuing our evenings with Shadalu. Namaste Shadalu. Namaste. Happy to be with all of you. We are happy to continue today uh, our part 121 on the veil part 2. Last time we took up some questions on the veil. And today we will continue this topic with the emphasis on building bridges and cutting channels across the veils. During our discussion, you may freely ask questions on our YouTube channel in the chat box. We are happy to continue this subject, which was very interesting and it opened up a lot of questions for many of us. <coughs> In the theme of the veil, we went in a much broader and deeper perspective of the veil itself, of the term veil, and the sense of the layers which, with which and from with, out of which this whole experience of reality is built. I thought to take this a step further because the topic itself has a complementing side and this is the aspect of building bridges and cutting channels of which this will be the primary discussion but before we enter that let's step back and look at the way this whole reality is constructed there are so to say two poles of reality the oneness above which is the origin of everything Without that, there is nothing else. All is expression of that. All is, so to say, multiplicity of that. And we use the reference of descending as it becomes more and more multiple. Divided is how we understand it. It's not divided. It is always multiplicity, unending, holding always unity. The other pole of existence, which we could use the word inconscient or we can say matter, Matter itself is as if starting from or made of fine divided particles. In fact, as we go down into the subatomic domains in the quantum levels, we have tiny fluctuations of what they call virtual particles forming and disappearing all the time everywhere at every point in the universe equally. They're so tiny that if you keep zooming on them, you'll find tinier and tinier ripples or points or sub sub particles, and you can go on dividing infinitely. So it seems as if at the bottom, you have an extreme of division an infinity, infinity of tiny, tiny, infinitesimal particles. And the whole of evolution seems to be a gathering of these to form clusters, atoms, molecules, and so on through the cells and then coming into our physical body we experience let's say organs and so on and then human beings combining to form family units social units and so on in this domain bottom up everything seems to be made of pieces because nothing is fundamentally joined or united or one you can merge them together as much as you want but at the end of the day there is this fine distinction against which it could split again. There is no oneness ever seen. Top down, you see only oneness, even in the multiplicity, all is the same one. Essentially the same one, taking on different aspects and forms. Bottom up, all is multiplicity, pretending to approach oneness of unity by combining and combining. So when you experience the universe top down, that is called Vidya in Sanskrit which Sri Aurobindo translates as knowledge of unity or knowledge of oneness. When you see bottom up and experience bottom up, then we call it avidya because there is fundamentally no division. So the right relation is to simply say that which appears to be not vidya, not oneness. So avidya, the a is only the displacement or the negation. And this Sri Aurobindo translates as knowledge of multiplicity. 
modern science primarily settles on the study of the multiplicity and therefore is categorized as avidya spiritual knowledge not as rationalized teachings or uh, holy books and texts but as an experiential knowledge is based on the oneness of the experience and therefore categorizes as vidya but as the isha upanishad insists you do not know reality unless you know both even it goes to say as far as this first it says that if you know only the avidya the knowledge of multiplicity then you are living in darkness because you don't know the reality which is oneness but it says if you know only vidya disconnected from the multiplicity then it is a greater darkness which sri aurobindo explains as meaning as you enter the oneness there is nothing within the oneness to compel you to know the multiplicity and therefore you can lose yourself in something which seems so whole so complete that you will say this is it there is nothing other and that would be a greater darkness because within the multiplicity everything is kicking you up towards oneness forcing you to somehow recognize there is a deeper underlying oneness over there there's nothing kicking you out and so that's the greater darkness when seen exclusively now all this is to first lay a background that in the merging of these two is the full play of this cosmos and the way the cosmos is built our experience in evolution being a bottom up rising growth evolution is primarily one of assembling of pieces and the evolutionary movement itself seems to be a greater and greater unification of these pieces around a deeper and deeper or higher underlying oneness the more that oneness manifests and seizes upon these pieces to form to reveal itself through those pieces the more evolved we are in a way of seeing somehow in our body we don't care what the atoms are we can replace them all the time as the body does we even replace our cells every day the skin is shedding huge amounts of cells we don't care somehow while the multiplicity is changing changing the underlying unity or oneness of our being as body as person is in held intact and when we become more and more mentalized it is a higher grade of unity expressed through this complex machinery and so on so all this comes down to one thing the more you are able to unify around some central deeper or higher principle the more integrated you are well the more evolved you will tend to be depending on the center or grade of consciousness around which you are unified this also comes to another important point mother uses this phrase sincerity and it's a problem we all have of uh, in the spiritual life that we find ourselves conflicted we find ourselves often fighting our own different parts and the phrase we use to describe that condition is insincere that is i want this but i also want that and i'm torn between these two and especially when it comes to spiritual life you want to develop certain capacities within you and at the same time you find yourself bound to tendencies which you want also but if you observe carefully you don't want both a part of you wants this a part of you feels bound or wants or needs that the different parts so at the end of the day the whole thing resolves to unifying disparate parts and tendencies within us and when these two are as if unified to some extent when they join automatically either you find the balance of continuity yes this also is included in that that uses this to manifest and so there's a continuum formed or if this part is totally incompatible and meaningless you just say up oh, no more interesting it fades out or drops or its function changes now to become something which is worthy of and unifies with the higher so sincerity really is equivalent to unification of disparate parts in sincerity is equivalent to different parts pulling in different directions 
But at the same time, you notice this sincerity or this unification is also the basic evolutionary method. The lower opening itself to the higher, the higher infusing into the lower, and the bridging of the two, the merging of the two in a transformed operation or substance. Isn't it? So when you think about it, all these words are different ways of looking at the same thing. Unifying, equivalent to sincerity, equivalent to evolution, equivalent to so many other terms which, which you could find. So in some sense we can say, creating the links between these different parts and bringing them closer into a unification is in fact the evolution. What is it that separates them? And then we come back to the word on which we dwelt so much last time, the veils. The thing which separates, the sense of disconnection, separation, the gap between these two, which we have called veils. And we saw veils in every possible way. So in a sense, the veils are, well, thinned out, parted, but when they part, what happens is there's a link that forms. So bridged. It's just a different vocabulary. And it's not just a play of words. I want you to notice that it is the nature of the experience. And I will take many examples as we go along. It is the nature of the experience that now we find there is no more a gap between these two. You can smoothly move, slide from this to the other. And as you are able to initially, it's a slight struggle. It's as if the bridge is very thin and narrow, tenuous, fragile. It breaks sometimes, you have to reform it. And then as you use it more and more and connect these two more and more, the bridge as if widens out until it becomes just one continuum. The island ego joined its continent is the phrase Sri Aurobindo uses. Of course, in a slightly different context, it is the individual uniting with the cosmic, the, the self, the oneness. But the same principle is really operating in all these different parts. That there is a deeper, higher, greater, there is a lesser, more superficial, inferior part, operation, experience, state of consciousness. And there's the bridging and then eventually the joining, until now there's a seamless continuity. In a sense, you could describe it now in a different vocabulary, the deeper, higher or spiritual, the truth, has now conquered the new territory and integrated it into its empire. Think about it. Look at it this way. We are spiritual beings invading the universe. Coming down, descending into the realm of matter and conquering material, integrating into our empire of spirit. And this integration process widening the scope and bringing in greater and greater powers of the spirit into this territory of the conquered spaces, that is evolution or that is transformation. Just different ways of looking at the same experience. That's why I said, when we come to the experience, the whole thing is very simple. So building bridges is as if your first entry to enter the new territory, which is not yet integrated. The bridge could go both ways. It could begin with the part yearning, aspiring. It could begin with the higher part within you, leaning, joining and maybe both operations joining to form the first stable link, which then grows wider and wider. I used another phrase in the title for today, building bridges and cutting channels, which is a different way of looking at the same thing. It's as if the energy, the consciousness, the power, the force from one, let's say the higher, flows now across the bridge, let's say, into the other. Or the force cutting through cuts a channel across the veil, through the veil, forming the bridge, linking, and doing the work. There, it's just another way of looking at the same thing, different vocabulary. But 
If you reduce it merely to a metaphor, then in the English language, your teacher will scold you, give you less marks by saying you have a mixed metaphor. Because if you build a bridge and you cut a channel, they're as if completely different processes. So don't think of it as a metaphor. Think of it rather as a real experience of what happens within you. Your consciousness leans, forces its way, enters a new part, seizes upon new territory, integrates, forming a bridge. But what it is doing is it is a channel of consciousness from a greater awareness to a lesser awareness. We'll take a simple example. You are learning to play the piano. Your fingers move. <clears throat> you go A. So typically when they're teaching you, you, it'll have to be reversed from your side, but you play at the same time the little finger and the thumb for A, B, C, D, E. Da, 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 da. And you have to somehow break the natural tendency of the hands to mirror themselves. Both thumbs don't move, it's rather one thumb and one little finger. When you start doing it the first time, your hand instinctively by habit of what its lesser inferior trained consciousness is tends to do the opposite what do you do at that point with your mind you infuse with great concentration and focus awareness into your thumb and your little finger of the other hand and consciously slowly move them avoiding other fingers to follow consciously move and now you can move faster. Initially it's difficult. Now you can move faster. And then now you can play. After a while, within a few minutes, sometimes within an hour, you can play with your mind wandering elsewhere and the fingers do it. What happened at that point is your consciousness cut a channel into the consciousness of the thumb and the little finger. While they were wired by habit of instinct to cross connect with both thumbs moving, you cut a channel in this way and then formed a link, a bridge of consciousness between these fingers. So at this point, don't think of channels and bridges merely as the metaphor that they represent. Forget the physical bridge and the physical channel of flow, purely here in terms of consciousness. And they are just two aspects of the same experience. The channel is the flowing consciousness, creating, forming a link, a bridge. The so common term you can say link, but there are two different aspects to the link, the flowing, cutting channel, and then forming of bridge, and then the bridge itself, which continues. Now, when I started doing this, you say, oh, wonderful, now I have trained my fingers. There's an automatism now because there's a rewiring of consciousness, connection, habit pattern. But then you notice you have to do something more complex. You have to move sometimes combinations of fingers to play chords. And sometimes the right hand has to move fast to play a rapid melody while the left goes doom, 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 and doo -doo 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 on the right hand. And this separation of repetition of, of rhythm is a struggle. You again infuse consciousness into the right hand, into the left, and consciously fill, create a link. First, cut a channel and then create a bridge linking these. But also you're creating a bridge, not only across fingers, a bridge from these fingers to your mind. So that what you read as the music, you have to be able to translate with your mind as the link in between. So there are different parts of your being, your nature, your consciousness, and they're all different things, which you're linking, forming bridges, and in order to form a bridge, you have to first as if cut a passage of consciousness. And as a very simple example, you can try this right now. Move your toes. Let's say without looking at them, you look at your toes or you feel your toes. Move them just like that. And they'll typically move like this. They're so undeveloped in consciousness. Try to move only the fat toe, the big thumb of the toe. Yeah, you can do that. The others remain pretty much the same. Now try to move your index toe separately. You can't. In your consciousness, the four are blurred. When you try to move one, all four of them move on the feet. 
Now, do this as an experiment. You look down at your toes. Visually, look down. And as you look down, pay attention particularly to the index toe. Try to feel it while observing, while looking physically. You can do it right now. And as you stare at it, you find you can move it slightly, just a little bit. If you try to move too much, then the other toes follow. But you can move just a little bit. Interesting. To further amplify, you can touch it with your fingers. Massage your index toe. And as you massage it, it grows more conscious. You are in fact infusing consciousness into it to hew away, cut a channel of consciousness. Linking your mind awareness into your physical body, into a part where there is only a blur of consciousness. And you are separating, distinguishing one channel into the index. And if you have massaged it a little bit and then again try to move, you notice, ah, now I can move more. Do this as an experiment. See how interesting it is. With our fingers, we have already done it from childhood. So they are reasonably developed that you can do things quite rapidly. With your toes, they are so neglected, especially children who grow up wearing shoes, have rarely developed the toes consciousness, one of the most unconscious parts of the body. But now with this, you are able to move the index slightly and then slightly more. Bit by bit, you notice as you put attention, you are able to move more. And then just as the others begin to start moving, you pause, hold back the rest and then move the index toe again. And you can move more and more and more. Work on this every few days. At the end of about a week, no, work on it every day, let's say, or several times a day. At the end of about a week, you will find you can distinctly move just the index toe without moving other fingers. Work on each one of them. You may or may not choose to take it fully, but work on it just a few days to convince yourself of what is happening, but also to observe that you are actually pushing consciousness, infusing consciousness and cutting a channel of awareness into the toe. And then seizing the toe with your mind awareness. And with the seizing, you develop also the control. At the same time, you're seizing on the others to not move when you don't want them to move. A fascinating process. This process is the slow process of evolution that has passed through all the animal stages, by which bit by bit, higher and higher levels of consciousness have cut their way into the physical consciousness and raised modified, raised, amplified, and then developed skills and powers. <clears throat> so we'll set aside the toes. Let's focus on the fingers now, where already a degree of consciousness is developed. The powers of the fingers have not yet been fully developed. So if you've played a musical instrument, you have amplified certain powers. For example, if you have played the tabla, just this movement of the, the ta sound, hitting it hard enough. In the beginning, you find your uh, hand is so weak. The muscles are so weak. And as you practice in a few days, it becomes strong enough that, that you can hit hard. This slight rotatory movement. What is interesting is, once you've developed it, for the rest of your life, you have that capacity. It's not a muscular development alone. It's a development of consciousness and coordination of the muscles, which is required. So, although I've never played the tabla now for maybe 20, 30 years, I could still take a tabla and hit hard enough to make this click sound, which I could not have done before this particular training. And there's a complex coordination, but that's not all the powers. I'll touch upon powers which are more, not just flexible. So there's a power of flexibility. Can you, for example, pull your finger back more than this much? For most people, there's a limit, you cannot go. But if you push slightly, you can take it much more. By training this, you'll find the muscles can grow until you can pull your fingers back much more, spread them out much more. That's not yet the powers. There's still hidden powers, for example, of vibration, sensation, still not the highest. You can actually develop the power of sight because all skin is sensitive to light. How would you do that? You would take, for example, a piece of paper, Take three or four pieces, start with three, red, blue, and white, but very distinct, sharply different. Put them in a box, close the cover, and with your eyes closed or with your hand inside without you seeing, 
pick up the red. You'll be surprised if you don't think you pick it up correctly. If you think too much, that interferes with the natural sensitivity which is there in the finger. Little children at the age of five are able to do this effortlessly. As adults, we are finding it very difficult to do because we start thinking, do I know? Can I? Is it possible? And in the process, you've broken the natural sensitivity of the finger's touch, which can distinguish colors, by the way. That's a hidden power, undeveloped. At the age of five, it's easy to do because all development of the finger consciousness is easy because the body itself is infusing mental awareness. So you catch the wave and amplify it maximally. So in this process still, what you're doing is you're hewing a passage of consciousness, lifting the quality of awareness, awakening tendencies, capacities, powers, organizing, harmonizing, integrating across fingers, across mind, across emotions. So a good dancer will have equally integrated, not just with the mind, but the body parts would be integrated with the life force, the vitality. And so a dancer may make a gesture, a mudra, as we call it, a significant gesture, and the mudra will throw out a power, literally. And so when the dancer does these movements, let's say, he, she, is spreading out life force, life energy in rhythms and patterns across the entire hall. I will use the term she more commonly felt, at least in Indian dance. You, she has to fill the whole hall and all the audience with that energy and the vitality. And as she plays and dances, she is literally a radiance infusing in all these rhythms and patterns and qualities of consciousness. So the movement of the dance here, all the physical hand moves this much, the life energy goes whoop. And then there's something even more complex which they have to do. They have to shift states, shift states of emotions. So for a moment she looks and there's this exaggerated surprise. What is this? And at that moment she has to amplify the experience of surprise to such a degree that you as the audience now connected with her energy feel the same and then having recognized what it is the fear and when she does that movement and feels experiences the fear infusing that into the collective but shifting from that state of surprise to fear and then to another emotion and to another and to play different parts even that is an integration across emotional states. For all of us, most of us, I will say at least, this is not developed. In fact, we are so immature in our handling of emotions, we are not very different from kindergarten children. And I'll give a simple example. When you are upset, your emotions are agitated, shaking. Can you shift consciously the state of your, let's say, anger? to a state of happiness? Very likely not. What you can do though, to get to the happiness, is move from anger to a state of calm and stillness. Then from calm and stillness, move to happiness. So here is a bridge from anger to calm, and from calm to happiness, another bridge. These are already existing. Mostly they're organized by nature through life experiences. But we never consciously developed a bridge from anger to happiness. But you have indirect bridges. So these are channels of consciousness through which you can flow to this state, from this to the other. These are bridged in a very narrow way. When you're fully identified with the anger and I say become calm, struggle, 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 and then it takes a while. So it's as if the, the link is very thin. And the shift of your state to this takes time and it's slowly done. If you have trained, for example, with dance to express those emotions, you can be in this state of anger and instantly shift back to calm in real life, in the midst of a crisis situation, and then shift back to happiness. Or if you have trained enough, you can go from anger, you say, no, I want to be happy, and you shift directly to happiness. That bridge is rarely trained. Life does not make you do it. Life cannot. So at best, you have the ability to come to calm as a 
common center from which you can shift to other emotions. So I would go the reverse now. From a state of happiness, can you move consciously to a state of anger? <laughs> Difficult. If you're truly happy, you can't. They're as if disparate, literally pointing in opposite directions. But you can come to a state of calm where the happiness becomes still, and then from there, with struggle, perhaps move to a state of anger. In certain occult traditions, they actually have you train these things to shift between states of emotions at will to full intensity, back and forth and across them. The use of this is just a way of integrating the different states of your life energy, of vitality, of your emotional nature. Integrating, meaning the more you are able to move consciously between these states, the more they as if blend into each other, the bridge is formed. At first to form the bridge, you have to literally cut a channel, a passage of awareness, which gives you a hook into that state. But then you amplify it until a bridge is formed. And now you flow from states. You can hold multiple states even. And this is all part of the mastery of the emotional nature. When sufficiently done, you will find none of the emotions can bind you. You can still express through emotions, but they are all felt as superficial layers of something underlying which is unmoved. Which incidentally happens when you train for dance in this way. And this was one of the great uh, reasons for the dance training and the way dance training was used for the spiritual development. To awaken this underlying sense of an underlying unity of which all these are faces, facets that you can freely replace like the soul taking on personalities across lives but bound to none. You take on states or emotions or moods and switch between them bound to none automatically awakening this deeper underlying aspect of the witness poise in the vital emotional centers or state levels. An equivalent would be to train in the mind with ideas. You can, for example, you have a belief which you're, you cherish so much. Take the opposite belief. You don't like it. Find a situation in which this opposite belief is right. It is true. And this, find a situation where your cherished belief is false. I would take you through a slow process of the exercise. It's an interesting um, thing to do. I hope someday to do a kind of a workshop type program for this. But you do this and then you find the falsification of your cherished belief. And then you suddenly have two very contradictory experiences, mental experience of idea forms or states of mind. You can't have both at the same time true. They're as if contrary to each other. And then you make this effort to find an underlying common ground of idea, awareness, knowledge, of which these two are aspects, even if seeming opposite, but still aspects. And then you have a common basis on which these two ideas can begin to integrate and become complementary. But still, you have done this in a very narrow part of your mind as an exercise. It's not your normal state of thought process of daily life. You formed a bridge. But the bridge has to widen until the state of integration of these different poises of mind have been unified. And your mind is able to see in one single vision these two aspects as a continuum. So there are many exercises one could do like this to integrate in the mental consciousness, in the domain of ideas, in the domain of knowledge spaces. For example, we have these artificial divisions of biology and chemistry and physics. So physics is matter, chemistry is, uh, well, chemicals. It's like a narrow part, but it's not really physics. It's all about reactions. And then you have the domain of biology, which is only living things. But if you look at each of these deep enough, the biology is based on the chemistry, which is based on the physics. Within the physics itself are the reactions which become the chemistry and the basis for the cellular operations. But there's something more, obviously, which is lost. Uh, in the physics. So you see a certain relationship, a continuity. And once in your consciousness, and I'm saying not as a theory, as an idea, you still have three different ideas. 
in the integration in the threads of ideas in the chemistry itself the threads link into the physics until you find seamless continuity and from the chemistry into the biology you build seamless continuity in the domain of knowledge and then you can approach biology with full awareness of its continuity with chemistry and physics as a master of that domain of interdisciplinary spaces but i would say it's not just interdisciplinary it's unified disciplinary experience extend that into psychology and then you have a unified continuity of this as a knowledge base that would be real knowledge of these fields not fragmented pieces and of which you have little links but you have to start with these bridges in the knowledge content itself which then widen out until it becomes a continuum now all this is to show you that this bridging which is done by cutting of channels is your key to integrating and even to evolution so far, I've tried to remain at a level which is mostly very practical, accessible to our daily life experience. But this is also the same method, exact same method by which our spiritual growth also takes place. So we'll look at it now from two perspectives. One is what you do and then what is done by the higher and deeper consciousness. As you do, for example, infusing your awareness into your fingers to make them conscious and you can do this right now simply feel the fingers of your hands it helps that you look at them focus on your index finger again just look at your hands and focus on the index finger and just feel the index finger more and more feel it until it becomes more conscious until you can distinguish and it's taken barely 20 seconds for your index finger to feel more conscious than the other fingers can you feel that? And at this moment, amplify the intensity of that awareness simply by willing it, amplifying it until literally you feel this index finger as if glowing in awareness, intensifying and further intensify. Now, in your own consciousness, you're going to describe it as radiating awareness. Don't worry about the words. Just find the words that you would naturally use to describe it. It's as if becoming as if brighter, more intense more radiant in awareness in what less than a minute perhaps all we did was focus awareness infuse it and amplify it you notice your index finger feels that but your palm does not and the other fingers don't not to the same degree maybe a little bit by reflection by extension of that now at the same time if your mind awareness which is fused on the finger also turns in awareness to some other experience of your consciousness a memory of an experience remember what it feels like to be in a state of deep peace can you recall that and if you have done that some of the basic exercises which we have been discussing before now as you feel the intensity of your index finger bright awareness recall the quality of that feel of the peace and feel it in the finger Feel as if your finger is infused or recalls or aligns with, joins with, expresses the peace until you begin to feel the peace in your finger. Now notice, interestingly, you have not had to enter in your own overall consciousness into the state of the peace. Just holding the awareness in the finger, which was a mentalized intensity, and you recalling the peace, but holding awareness in the finger, you begin to feel that kind of a deep, soothing, cooling, dense kind of peace. Interesting. And continue to amplify it. Deepen it. Densify it. I'm not giving you much time, but if you continue this another five minutes, it would be even more intense. But what you've experienced was a shift already. Now at this point, if you just feel your palm, move your fingers and feel, you will feel your index finger distinctly, not only more conscious, but as if holding some kind of a density of that peace quality, substantiality. 
And yet the rest of you may not feel it much, or you may do, but you did not consciously do anything special there. In the finger is something special. So what did we just do? From your normal mind awareness, we turn to the physical body, infusing, cutting a channel, but or amplifying the existing flow, amplified this, and then the same awareness turned to within itself to a memory of a different state, which is very different from this. Remembering that this awareness, which is you, became the link between these two states. A bridge, a continuity was formed, and one state or its influence flowed into the other. Your finger began to feel the peace naturally growing, which as it filled it, amplified in it. You could take a body part which is injured, which needs healing, which has pain, and consciously do this. First amplify awareness and then turn that awareness as if in remembrance of that peace, calm, stillness. Remember the thing you want, not the thing you don't want. And you notice immediately a soothing numbness, peace settling in that part. The pain immediately diminishes and sometimes goes away, instantly. The question is, can you hold that poise? Initially, for a short time, the moment you start moving in your normal routine, quickly the thing falls into the old pattern or state of non-peace. So you will train it. You will train it to hold. And that's really the spiritual change of transformation in a very small step. If you train it to hold, that's it. That state now becomes normal. What was earlier a state of, let's say, disturbance, struggle, pain, unconsciousness, inertia, etc., has shifted to a new state now, which is of greater clarity, awareness, freedom from pain, greater consciousness, and so on. Greater receptivity and perhaps greater aspiration. Into the finger, you can bring in the remembrance of the Divine Mother or the sense of an aspiration to feel the Divine Mother and to receive and to serve her, into the finger, into the hands, bit by bit into parts of your body, to as if turn in remembrance and feel of aspiration to the Divine Mother, as in a call, as if a prayer. The body's prayer, Mother says, work is the body's best prayer to the Divine. Unfortunately, totally misunderstood and misused, people will say, work hard. That's your prayer. No, it's not. A donkey works hard. Is the donkey praying? Is the body of the donkey praying? No. But when you put your body in this state and turn it in a conscious aspiration and then work in that spirit, that's body's prayer. Because body is not mind, not emotion. What's left is the physical consciousness turning in a quiet, wordless, yearning, aspiration, prayer. The words don't matter anymore. In relation, entering in relation to the divine. Done in this way, yes, work is the body's best prayer to the divine. But it's not mechanical work. It's not unconscious work. It's not, it is this movement. And then work emanating from this. Do this as a simple practice with a part of your body, with your fingers, with your hands. And maybe in time with your whole body, in a general way, in a general aspiration, or with specific infusion in all the parts, and then entering into some activity which you do. So with your fingertip now made more conscious, you pick up a pen, and then do as if a repetition of a japa, of some verse of invocation, or just the name of the, of the Divine Mother, some activity of cleaning, wiping, but something which uses that finger but maintains this poise. That would be the prayer. And the result will be immediately the contact with her presence. Immediately an infusion of her consciousness, which now again we will use the word channels being cut, because a higher consciousness now infuses in response to your call of aspiration into your finger, lifts it, so to say. You'll feel the difference. And to whatever extent you feel, recognize it's there. 
don't worry if you don't get a dramatic change you get a small change it proves the principle and many small changes will build in a few days this took you perhaps 10 minutes that we have been discussing to bring it to an experience that yeah actually my finger can aspire you felt it what's the potential for the rest of your body think about it play with it experiment explore develop it now if you could combine this with some exercise done in the spirit where in the stretch of the asana you infuse or awaken or amplify the consciousness and then turn in aspiration if you're doing bodybuilding muscle development if you could build your body with that infusion and aspiration if you're jogging maybe focusing on a part of the body or just the general sense of the rhythm of the jog and turn the body consciousness in a general way even could be done if you're playing an instrument of music if you could infuse in this way if you're preparing food if you could be conscious of your fingers as if doing a conscious consecration it doesn't matter what the activity is that you can bring in this angle amplify and then open and turn upward this has to be done by your mind's awareness first infusing intention and so this infusing experience is extremely important this is the cutting of the channels the same thing turning upward becomes now the two way link you turn to something higher you're as if in aspiration opening to receive and then there is a response from above which comes fills and then forms its own cutting of channels by a greater power than yours but by your turning to receive its action the result of this is that the higher power entering in your fingers let's say will very quickly awaken in the fingers an intuitivized quality now what will happen is these fingers which you have sensitized and into which you have awakened this aspiration and into which a receptivity has developed you will find rapidly growing to become more conscious more intuitivized and as if your fingers know in themselves what they need to do if you are preparing food you will find you will throw the right proportion of foods spontaneously and the food will be more delicious for two reasons one you have the balance of the proportions of ingredients but also at the same time the quality of consciousness which is also flowing through your fingers i've mentioned before several times in these series the example of uh, kapali shastriya who was uh, one of the very early devotees of sri aurobindo who had been earlier with gadapati muni trained under him and along the lines of the similar kind of vedic interpretation that sri aurobindo did as well as certain practices which were similar then he came to with ganapati muni to uh, ramana maharshi with him there was such a deep intimacy and oneness developed at a certain point that when he chose to come to sri aurobindo maharshi shed a tear and said there was just a thin veil which remained which would have completed the merge full merging he came to sri aurobindo i think the only disciple who came to sri aurobindo with already a self realization he was given work at some point in the department of construction in the section of paints he had to mix paints in the old days you only got red green blue and you had to mix to get the right proportion of any other color you did not buy colors as we do today but you had to get them exactly right so that the new paint matches the old in perfect uh, continuity and you don't have patches of different colors so to get that mix he had to mix exact quantities he would scoop the exact quantity and pour it was the exact amount not needing to weigh or if you weigh then just verifying you pour it and it's exact amount that's the intuition in the hand it's not the mind which is doing it it's not just mentalization of uh, the intuitivization of the mind that of course would be a prerequisite to some degree for this to happen but this could happen independently which happens in the case of most great musicians let's take a great pianist as they move 
there's a point where they are immersed in the inspiration of the music and the fingers do what is needed to express the mood precisely in a nuance which a student will watch him and see how the fingers moved and replicate the finger movement to try to catch that nuance and then if you get it right, you'll say, ah, yes, this creates that mood. But the musician who created the mood did not have to think how to get the mood. He lived in the mood the fingers followed to, to express in just the right way to get that mood. So the fingers develop their own intuitivization, as was the case in Kapali Shastriya's hand. And we don't know the full scope of what was his body's intuitivization. But this is just to say that all these things are not out there, difficult, far away. They are within our reach as we are today in the simple exercise that we just did. All that is required on our part is to make that tiny effort. And then to persist to develop it to whatever extent we choose to. And that's really our choice. How much time we give. For the things which are important for us, we always find time, isn't it? And as I said, you can do this in the midst of pretty much any activity and it takes very little time to amplify and then you merge into the activity you want to do. So again, experiment with this. Notice the principle, cutting a channel, building a bridge, integrating, unifying, amplifying aspects, bridging states of consciousness, of states of uh, lower, higher, whatever, integrating in the process, unifying in the process. And one of the side effects is increasing of the sincerity. Sincerity not in a moral sense, sincerity in the spiritual sense of the integrity of the whole personality and in your whole nature. So that now when in your general mental awareness, when a higher influence comes, it flows easily into the fingers and all other parts of the body which have been more mentalized. And when that flows and it cuts away, amplifying and now infusing a still higher grade and channels are formed, grooves are created. And that force, higher force now working, not just when one finger, as you had to do consciously choose one finger after another, that flows into all the fingers, into all the parts of the body including it seeps into layers that you can't directly access with your mind and cuts passages, brings awareness, amplifies and so on, intuitivizes eventually while integrating. So now what you've done, you've created a slight mentalized base of awareness, you've turned upward and then the higher flow coming in fills and does. And your effort at that point is simply to remain as a vessel to receive the flow. What it did was, what we have discussed last time as veils, have rapidly been made to become thin, have been dissolved completely or at least rapidly parted and then dissolved. Whichever way it forms, the veils are rapidly removed by the action of this higher influence. And because the influence is to amplify awareness as you experienced in your finger, it feels like a lighting up of intensification of awareness. In fact, you experience that higher flow as also light. Everything that it touches becomes brighter, clearer, freer, wider, more conscious, more intuitive, automatically. And that's why the experiences of light, in fact, the true nature of light is in this higher consciousness. As it fills the lower, it brightens and awakes consciousness. I want to read from a, a little booklet written by one T. Kodandarama Rao, which is called At the Feet of the Master. And here he describes his two and a half to three years with Sri Aurobindo in the early days before the ashram was formally established. And he was describing his experiences, how being in Sri Aurobindo's presence, there would be this huge inner rush of the force and the peace and the light which would work in him. And now I read just a portion which comes at the later phase. He says, a few more experiences. The divine Shakti began to descend with greater force into the head centers and below 
and an arrangement of molecular structure began to take place in the brain and the navel region. A kind of electric drilling was taking place in the head and there was felt the breaking of cells and loosening of knots in the whole being. Channels for the flow of light and force were being hewed out and what seemed to be metaphorical phrases when the master wrote about the pouring of light and force were becoming concrete experiences. You see, this is the point, it's not a metaphor, it's the nature of the experience itself. Literally, the force cuts passages, opens out, and suddenly you realize, oh, now my hands are more conscious. Oh, they've become more intuitivized. I didn't do anything. It was, you can feel the action of the force doing it. As I sat before the master for meditation, the whole being used to become numb as his force began to work in me and fill my nerves with light and force. I felt as if he was transmitting his divine force and light into me. In his presence, the force was felt intensely and it began to work in the body day and night and was omnipresent. Just an example of what happens when it gets amplified and intensified. But this same thing happens already in a first trickle in the preparatory stage as you already felt something in your finger with an effort of hardly 10 minutes. When the same experience is taken with the whole being, opening and receiving, concentrating on the divine presence above and allowing it to flow down. I'll read from one of Sri Aurobindo's letters on this using the same vocabulary. It is in response to one of the sadhakas writing to him. Sri Aurobindo writes, It, the pressure felt in meditation, it is what we call the pressure of the force, the force of the higher spiritual or divine consciousness, the mother's force. It comes in various forms, vibrations, currents, waves, a wide flow, a shower like rain, etc. So he's describing a whole variety of ways in which you may feel it at first. Don't worry how you feel it. You may feel just a sh gentle lift, drift, drizzling, whatever form it takes, or it may be something more wide. It passes to each center in turn. He describes, spreads to throughout the body. The rotatory movement is the movement of the force when it is working and forming something in the being. So you, you read in Godanda Ram Rao's description when he speaks of this, um, a kind of electric drilling was taking place in the head and there was felt the breaking of cells and loosening of knots in the whole being. Well, that's the movement of the force as it is working to build something and integrate. And now imagine, what you could not have done, going all the way down to the cells, this thing is able to do penetrating, working and harmonizing, constructing. Literally, what would have taken you years, perhaps lifetimes of integration at that level of physical consciousness to form a new capacity is being done here in minutes, hours, days, whatever it may be, to form, organize. And you are only this container holding. So there are many letters of Sri Aurobindo where he discusses what it represents at different points. The exact same description, you remember what he says, what sounded metaphorical, the exact same description is found in the Vedas. And the description there is also precisely the same and I quote from Sri Aurobindo when he is commenting on the uh, in the secret of the Veda. Adri, the hill or rock, is a symbol of formal existence, existence in form, and especially of the physical nature. And it is out of this hill or rock that the herds of the sun are released and the waters flow. So it's the light and the substance of the consciousness flowing like water. The streams of the madhu, the honey, the soma, are said also to be milked out of this hill or rock. The stroke of the horse's hoof, that's the force, on the rock, releasing the waters of inspiration, would thus become a very obvious psychological image. So you feel the force, the horse's hoof, 
it releases the inspiration so i skip this in savitri shri urbindo writes the same description in a different uh, slightly different vocabulary he says he and i think this is ashwapati he mixed in the radiant pastimes of the unborn etc and felt its honey of felicity flow through his veins like the rivers of paradise made body a nectar cup of the absolute you would have without the background you could have read these lines and said ah it's a poetic imagery feels nice to read it but you know he's actually describing an exact description of the flow of the divine force particularly in its aspect of delight flow through his veins like the rivers of paradise made body a nectar cup of the absolute we hold and receive his nectar and it has the quality of the absolute which fills all these are experiences which are intended for our bodies and that's why I cherish your body take care of it build its capacity to receive all this is just waiting up there to flow in it's not something far away it's not something difficult the problem is our lack of capacity and therefore a premature descent which would destabilize and therefore the grace withholds what she could otherwise easily pour so build your capacity allow the earlier stages of the peace and other aspects of the influence to settle and grow and widen and then all this is waiting to fill there are of course in the way there's various uh, passages where i read just one which your window translates uh, from this is from the hymns to agni o conscious seer of the truth agni is addressed the truth alone perceive in my consciousness so it's invocation to agni as a conscious power but also which is a power which is latent within you an aspect of the divine aspiration let's say so this aspiration turns or you're invoking it to turn to perceive alone the truth in your consciousness cleave out many flowing streams of the truth it is cut through the many flowing streams of the truth so you may first have an opening to the higher consciousness truth perception in a part of your mind but it's a part remember from there that flows agni as a force as a power of action flows to spread and cutting out passages into all the parts of your being to turn them equally make them conscious and turn them to the truth not by force nor by the duality can achieve can i achieve the journey nor attain to the truth of the shining worker the fertilizing lord i don't comment on this but you get the feel of it to become the shining uh, worker attain to the truth not by duality nor by force but by this Uh, this is another which is also from uh, mandala 1 i'm reading from shri urbindo's translation cleave open sideways the channels as if the joints of the shining cow cow go go is light the spiritual light cleave open sideways the channels as if the joints of the shining light and send to range the floods of the waters it's a prayer asking for this movement literally which is the movement of awakening leading to the transformation but this is the nature of the work done from the top down action or even eventually from the in out action of the spiritual or another line which also i'm reading from this his translation in the veda the divine waters that flow whether in channels dug or self born whose movements is towards the ocean may those divine waters foster me so they cut the channels but all these channels lead to the ocean the ocean is the oneness so as it works within you it awakens and turns everything towards the oneness so if all these streams channels passages cutting turn like this so you get a sense of how this works isn't it uh the descriptions are literal this is the point and i hope some day 
I will have to spend time for myself. I, it's one of my dreams to be able to study Sri Aurobindo's commentaries on the Veda in this way, that you can actually enter the full sense of the verse and glimpse and experience it in this way. I don't know if I will have it in this lifetime, but for those who feel drawn to that, it is a worthy exercise, but you must have this first, the foundation of the, to be able to appreciate the nature of the experience. And then it will be something extraordinary. Um, let me just take a pause. So we've looked at this overall sense of evolution as an integration process, rising to higher levels of awareness, organizing powers of each level of consciousness as it integrates and fully developing the powers on each of these levels. As we have it today, what we are, we have not yet had the full powers developed. We have only built an organized base that is our mind, life, body integrated. Into each of these levels are far greater powers hidden, especially all the way down into the material, where literally in the unconscious of matter is infinite potential waiting to emerge. That your mind is unable to tap because they are so deeply bound in the darkness. But in the seat of the darkness is the Divine Presence Himself. There's this line from uh, one of Sri Aurobindo's poems. Uh, and into the midnight his shadow is thrown. Uh, I forget the first part of the line. And then he says, when darkness was blind and engulfed within darkness, he was seated within it, immense and alone. This darkness, blind and engulfed within darkness is a Vedic imagery describing the inconscient. You see, the same Satchidananda becomes inconscient. How? Well, it dwells upon itself in exclusive self-focus and becomes blind to all else. It's never blind. It's only dwelling on its own delight, but in a narrow, tiny focus of what we would call particles. When darkness was, so this is darkness now, and that darkness becoming blind to everything else, and then engulfed within darkness, that's the layering typically, which is described in the Veda, of complete loss of all capacity to see and to know, or even to be. That's the nature of the inconscient. But within that, he was seated within it, immense and alone. Now this is the divine seated in the inconscient, waiting to reveal through matter, of which a first preliminary awakening has been made by our life and our mind, waiting for the still higher powers of the supermind to come in and release the waters from the Adri, from the hill, from the rock. Vedic imagery again. So the higher flows come, hew away channels, awaken and then release the waters, release the treasures and so on. And the gods once again can take the treasure, treasures which were lost and stolen and bound in the caves are now revealed and again given to the gods. So these symbols are really literal translations or descriptions of these experiences. A power awakes. I gave this example earlier of the finger being able to see. It's a truly a trivial part of the power of the physical consciousness, of the skin in the body. There's so much more things which we, which we cannot imagine, which belong to a consciousness of infinity. And in particular, the aspect of the bliss experience through the senses. So all this is just to give you a sense of our evolution, however much we may think has been achieved, is only a preliminary base achieved upon which the higher entering would really lift fully to the potential that is there. And that is done by the cutting of the channel and the integration by the building of bridges. And for us at a very superficial level, the integration of different parts, which, which we so value, which we so need is done very rapidly, but much more of the deeper inner and higher parts. All these are integrated by this action of the force. The veils therefore dissolved. I touch upon the question which was put last time 
in the comments uh, on the last the video last time from Sujata. She says in one of your lectures, you had mentioned about untying the knots in integral yoga as opposed to the cutting of the knots. You will recall this when we spoke of the ascetic uh, approach and the uh, approach of the integral yoga, the affirmative approach. Instead of cutting, which the ascetic does, here the untying is the vocabulary Shirobindo uses. And not just untying, laying them out in harmony to form a woven, beautiful pattern expressing the divine possibilities. And you see in the letter which I read earlier, Sri Aurobindo uses this phrase, as this force flows, it loosens the knots. In fact, eventually it also unties, it organizes and thus awakes what was lost. So this is one of the very important ideas of the evolution is that all that is being evolved was concealed before in an involution. It's only lost truths, lost powers, which are now being revealed and awakened as they are organized. So her question is, is it the same as lifting the veil? Uh, so not exactly the loosening of the knots, but the joining of the different parts is the lifting of the veil. And uh, then she asks, and also is the lid the same as the golden lid? <coughs> Mentioned in the Upanishads, yes. Sri Aurobindo identifies the golden lid from the Isha Upanishad with this. It's the same vocabulary he uses. But then there's an interesting thing he says. So there's one lid which is the lid which is just here from the physical consciousness to the higher, which for which it feels to be blocked. But when you deepen, interiorize deeper within and then you turn up, it's much thinner and you are easily able to open and access and receive. But there's a second use of the word lid. <clears throat> so you can say this is the lid. But in the Isha Upanishad, the lid is used in a much higher sense, where it says the face of truth is covered by a golden lid. Remove that lid, that is the prayer. And Sri Aurobindo says that the face of truth is of course the supramental consciousness. There is the overmental consciousness before, which is like a lid. Not the lower ranges of the overmental, which are themselves quite extraordinary, but the highest ranges of the overmental, he says, feel as if they are identical with the supramental. And you could say you are in the supramental, when in fact you are not. And that's the lid. That's the golden lid to which he refers. And he says, it was that to which the Isha Upanishad was um, referring in its highest sense. But at the same time, the same phrase can be used to understand the lid in the lower sense also. So many of these Upanishadic texts, Vedic texts are intended to be known on multiple levels. You feel you've understood them and they apply to you. And then you enter a higher state of consciousness and you see, oh my God, now they apply much more literally, much more completely. And that's part of the beauty of, this, uh, of these texts. They would be useless if they only applied on a higher plane. They apply on all the planes. And so on each plane, of course, with a limited uh, degree, but on each plane, they help you move one step. And then when you've reached that, the same verse moves, helps you move another step and so on. So that's why they are described the Rik, that is the lines of the Veda. The Riks are rik described as aids, steps even in our journey, in the spiritual journey. So this, why I was speaking of the golden lid here, this part, the layer, which is the overmental, but not supramental, but almost exactly identical in quality. He says, the distinction can be felt only when that layer has to act on matter. There, this overmental lid, however much it seems like the supramental fails, and only the highest supramental can act there and release the resistance, the ultimate resistance of the inconscient. Of course, before that, many things have been done. But you still have the knot of the inconscient, which is released only by the highest, which leads to the full transformation of the physical consciousness. So all this to say is the highest eventually has to come all the way to the lowest for the completeness of the breakthrough, for the perfection itself in matter, of matter. I think this is broadly what I wanted to convey regarding these two phrases, building bridges and cutting channels and how the integration is the process, in fact, and how it can be done most directly by the direct flow of the higher as well as from within us. 
your mind starting the process and then turning to link, form a bridge to the higher, which then flows through cutting a channel and acts into the whole. This is centrally the process of the yoga. A similar process also in the inward experience from inside as if the deeper influences flow and they cut passages, channels, touching the mind, touching the emotions, eventually even touching the body and awakening in them, preparing in them the direct influence of the psychic being. But the building of bridges and the cutting of channels, these are the two principal methods of the integral yoga itself when you see it this way and then this would complete the understanding of the veils which we took up last time i think uh, if there are any questions here ah okay <laughs> there was one passage which i thought also might be useful to read because this phrase channel sure uses in a slightly different context but you will see the meaning of it he is describing the nature of the practices which come from the more Vedantic type uh, yogic practices. You will remember this is something we have discussed in an earlier session where the Vedantic method primarily rely, relying on your personal effort. So you with your limited capacity have to put great effort to cut through and make this passage let's say waking up the consciousness in your finger or something, developing a capacity. And sometimes the methods themselves are indirect. They're not, as we've seen the direct method of the integral yoga. So you may work on your finger, training it through playing an instrument by doing more work, hoping to amplify the consciousness and so on, or repeating a word, a mantra, doing asanas every day. Yes, of course it will help. It makes a huge difference up to a point. But then it seems to reach a limit. But the point is, all these are helpful, but they're indirect and therefore slow. So he says, time is necessary. Never be troubled by the time taken. It is a tremendous work that is being done in you. The alteration of your whole human nature into a divine nature. The crowding of centuries of evolution in a few years. Now, I have to remind this again, something we have spoken before. One year, one century of growth, of normal life, should be the proportion for us. Maybe not immediately, but we should get to that reasonably soon. If we dedicate ourselves in some kind of a regular effort, and it's not difficult. This is the part which is not difficult because you're not doing it. It is done by the higher action. The crowding of centuries of evolution into a few years. You ought not to grudge the time. There are other paths that offer more immediate results or at any rate by offering you some definite kriya exercise, a technique. You can work at yourself. Gives your ahankara, ego, the satisfaction of feeling that you're doing something. So many more pranayamas today, so much longer a time for the asanas, so many more repetitions of the japa, so much done, so much definite progress marked. Because the measure of progress taken is always in number of counts of the exercise of the kriya. So somebody will say, if yesterday I did 10 repetitions of japa, today I did 20, I have progressed twice as much. No. You have only progressed in your capacity to repeat the words. What is the change in consciousness? More often than not, you just tire out after a while. The utility of the mantra fades if with mere mechanical repetition. So if you need to use mantra, well, use it with full awareness for the result gained. But don't bother repeating beyond what is the result gained. Because it's not the number, it is the quality of the result. Focus on that. But to the ego, it gives so much importance, you see. And so he says, but once you have chosen this path, you must cleave to it. Those are the human methods, not the way that the infinite Shakti works. 
which moves silently, sometimes imperceptibly to its goal, advances here, seems to pause there, then mightily and triumphantly reveals the grandiose thing that it has done. You will see how evolution of in nature works. Push here, then that, then that, and then suddenly combining two or three things and then creating a sudden breakthrough. It's exactly the same way working in us. Why is it like that? Because she works simultaneously on all parts of your nature. But she pushes in the part which is most awake, most receptive, most plastic. Other parts she is preparing the ground, softening up the material. And then when this part has moved, she picks the next, pushes, and then another, and then suddenly combines these to build something like a stable base now, from which you can't fall back. And then again pushing another part and another part. This can be done by a tremendous multifaceted intelligence, infinitely faceted intelligence, which you couldn't have done. Because you'd be stuck on one track and then another track, and you would never have the full sense of the experience. That's the limitation of the mental consciousness. But when the Shakti works in you and you give yourself as completely as you are currently capable of, she works on all those parts and works deeper. So, then he compares. Artificial paths are like canals hewn by the intelligence of man. You travel easily, safely, surely, but from one place, from one given place to another. So if you take the analogy which we took, the example we took of the emotions, you move from this state to that and then to the other, but you can't move directly between them. This path of the action of the Shakti within you is the broad and trackless ocean by which you can travel widely to all parts of the world and are admitted to the freedom of the infinite. All parts of your nature, being simultaneously awakened and integrated, you can shift into any poise, any state, any quality of awareness and power, between layers, between worlds. I think it was Narad who shared this when he first met the mother. She said to him, you must bring down a new music. And then she said, you must know how to move from consciousness to consciousness. You see, this is something so central to the yoga, to be able to consciously shift between gradations of awareness, between states of awareness, between parts of awareness or your nature. And that's how you blend, you integrate, you join, forming bridges, cutting passages, channels. And this integration, especially as it grows around a higher and higher center or opens to a higher and higher influence, then the rest is taken up by the action of the Divine Shakti. I think this would be a reasonably complete uh, discussion on the theme of the veils and its complementing aspects. One more important thing. I'm linking this now to the physical form in which the mother helped people. And we'll close with this. I mentioned last time, you remember how the mother was infusing the overmental gods and their consciousness into the human monkeys, so to say. And uh, it was she who was bridging that higher state, highest state. And then, remember last time we started with this idea, all consciousness is also substance of consciousness. So within her, the bridge formed. the full substantial column of all the levels, her consciousness, literally, she infuses into the human being. And now in that person, the link is made because of the continuum formed. This was the reason for the close physical contact because in that state, the most physical dense layer of substance was transmitted thus. This was the basis or the reason for the pranam where people would come and receive directly mother's hand on their head or bow to her feet and she would place the hand. Very symbolic, you see. The feet 
spontaneously represent the full column from the highest all the way down to the most material physical vibration in her. The full column now in the most material part of your consciousness received, infused, bridging to the highest. On the other hand, her hand, which is bringing the highest consciousness, pouring this highest grade onto the head. So building within you the column. Interesting. Think about it. So this is the basis or the rationale for the pranam and the importance that mother gave to it for many years, sometimes several times in the day. Let me just take a moment to find a passage. So, the reason mother gave so much importance for that. And then what happened is, very quickly, people began to, well, misuse. There were people who would uh, simply sit there as a social requirement or to gossip, to watch how mother smiles or not at X or Y and things like that, which were all very unfortunate, very sad. And the result was that uh, mother had to stop it finally. Physically, her body was being drained. Sri Aurobindo comments on this saying that people come to suck her vital energy to feel good, to run their day or regenerate after a tired day. But that's not the purpose for which the pranam is done. It is for this deeper spiritual purpose. But they would suck only the vital energy. The right way would be or they would throw their junk or their dullness, darkness, problems onto her. Whereas the right state would have been for them to simply open and receive and allow her to form her consciousness into you. I am highlighting this because it is exactly the same thing which is currently available to us. When this pranam was ended and it was replaced by a meditation only, the mother would sit with the disciples and there would be the meditation and she would transmit the same way and Sri Aurobindo notes in one of these letters that her uh, the requirement was that you create an inner connection with her through which she is able to transmit the exact same thing which she would do from this direct physical contact And then he says, he chides one of the disciples, he says, after all these years of pranam and opportunity given, by now you should have been able to build at least that much. Isn't it? But from the inner contact, she can give exactly the same thing. And this is the point I make today. For all of us, that this is available from the inner contact, the exact same transmission that was received by the pranam. And... At most, you may say that, yes, the physical touch of her hand, that is missing. But is that so important if the material transmitted, the use of it can be the same? In Savitri, there is the line that Sri Aurobindo writes, she is the golden bridge, the wonderful fire. Or Before that, the spirit's alchemist energy is hers. She is the golden bridge, the wonderful fire. And in a sense, what she is holding within her own consciousness, as she infuses into you, that's the bridge. She, within you, is the golden bridge, isn't it? And the energy that she fills in you is the alchemist energy, which has this transforming power. So using the Vedic imagery, we would say, The Divine Mother forms herself into you, which is, by the way, one of the phrases Sri Aurobindo uses in that little booklet, The Mother, in the passage that goes, if you desire this transformation, put yourself uh, before her without uh, caveat. And then he says, she will form herself into you. This this is the Vedic phrase. But in the Vedic uh, vocabulary, the Divine Consciousness forms itself into you, which is the process of the transformation. In a more modern vocabulary, where we do not 
uh, see this, we see these more ex- as metaphors, we will say her consciousness fills you and transforms you from within. It's the same thing, but the first is more true in the experience. You actually feel her literally filling you and shaping you. There is less and less of you as a separate being, more and more you merging into her and in the joy of the immersion in her. So this, I had another phrase in mind, which I somehow could not find built, is the bridge. Somewhere Sri Aurobindo has this phrase, built is the bridge. And so this is the work that we have to do. This is really the nature of the sadhana. And that's why the theme for today, we will close with this. And we can remain in a quiet concentration, invoking the Divine Mother to fill us, to form the bridge, to become the bridge, not only linking us with the highest Divine Consciousness, but also form the bridge and become the bridge between our disparate parts, tendencies, states of Consciousness and our nature that she can integrate us around our deeper and higher center of awareness, our deepest and highest currently available. And thereby effect not only the harmonization, but the sincerity and the transformation and the evolution, all of which as we saw are aspects of each other, the same movement. And we can hold this in quiet concentration in an invocation to her, <clears throat> receive her blessing in the pranam that we make, but now from the direct contact of the inner consciousness, because she is always present. Perhaps we can close this with a collective chant of Om all together, wherever we are in the world, held in her arms as her children and one family, one spiritual family. Repeating Om three times together. Oh.